glad that you are here. A couple of things about ethics is ethics really are like muscles and they need to be exercised regularly. So for some of us, or depending on when you started in the field, you may have taken an ethics course and certainly things have changed. I'll speak from the eye. For myself, certainly things have changed. So it's really good that OASIS, um, the state uh, agency um, in New York does require six hours of ethics. And another article I was reading recently is that most people talk ethics, but they don't always do what they say. So it's really an opportunity to kind of look at what do you do? Um, what don't you do? Uh, whenever I know I'm doing a course in ethics, I always kind of pay attention to what's going on. And um, I was interviewing people in my family. So I have sisters who are teachers, yes, code of ethics. Uh, sisters who are nurses, code of ethics. A brother who's a judge, code of ethics. So many of our fields have codes of ethics. And uh, we'll be talking about specifically the addiction counselor ethics today. Some of you have seen this before, you know we have to put this disclaimer so that the development of the uh, these training materials was supported by a grant. M. Chapel, Mike Chapel is our supervisor, and it comes from the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, um, SAMHSA. Uh, the key with this, by the way, is the contents really are the responsibility of, of the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center and do not necessarily represent the official views of SAMHSA. So we always have to put that disclaimer. Here's something we always put, by the way, in all our courses, as does every person, I think, who trains for the ATCCs natural, nationally. And we just want to kind of put out that words have power. So many of you have taken courses, you know, on, you know, we talk about person-centered treatment. So we really want to talk about the person first. So the person with substance abuse, the person with depression, the person with and um, so I can proselytize on that. I do a course called Changing Language, which maybe I'll repeat again at some point in the next couple of months, but I've done it a couple of times recently and uh, will be glad to do it um, again. And, uh, working in treatment with people with substance use disorders and also people with co-occurring disorders. And we did a lot of work on how to go back to your job and stay in recovery and also how to get a job if you didn't have one. Uh, one thing I'll add here, by the way, is I have been teaching ethics for uh, many years. I taught at NYU for a long time in the applied psychology department for the vocational counselors. And uh, this is something that I really enjoy. Here's what we're gonna do, and this is the goals of the course, is to um, raise awareness of the importance of ethical professional practice to assure the health, safety, and recovery of people with substance use disorders. Oh, we've got somebody from Puerto Rico, bienvenida. So, um, and I see some repeat people from last time. So, um, the important thing I think about the goals of ethics is it really, when you look at what you do for a living and how do you keep people safe, and that's what ethics does. So we'll look at also the second bullet to raise awareness of the importance of ethical standards as a profession, because we want to give obviously the highest quality of service. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we'll talk about what ethics is, and we'll also look at some of the um, considerations of ethics. We'll look at a couple of different codes of ethics uh, what NADAC stands for is, see, everybody's changed their name recently. They've kept sometimes the same initials, but NADAC, NADAC now uh, says that they are the Association for Addiction Professionals. Um, they are a really good agency, by the way, to look at for information. Uh, the Code of Ethics for OASIS, which is now called the Office of Addiction Services and Supports, um, they, we took, we at OASIS, or those of you who work for OASIS actually took the code of ethics from 
uh, from NADAC. So they're often all related. And this morning, as I was preparing the slides for next week on ethics and self-care, I was reviewing some of the codes of ethics of the, um, actually the, the CRC, Certified Rehabilitation Counselors, uh, the Association of Counselors um, nationwide. And it's just interesting, next week I'll compare, but people do tend to say the same things, they say it in different words. I think what OASIS says, by the way, is they're kind of like simpler and to the point. So some of the codes of ethics for people are 25 pages uh, for OASIS, much briefer, and we'll go through them today. Uh, we'll look at the most common violations. And interestingly enough, I've been in the field for a while. The same violations that occurred when I started in the field are still the same violations that occur today. So it's interesting too, and I was thinking this in terms of um, working at home and confidentiality and also um, some things which we'll talk about when we get to some of the specifics. All right, so for tomorrow, tomorrow actually we'll talk about how to prevent ethical misconduct. I'm from the school of prevention first, rather than waiting till something really bad happens. Um, so we'll look at that. I'll also give you the opportunity, we'll look at some hypothetical situations uh, of what you would do and what you might not do. You don't have to answer all the questions. Like I was thinking one of the questions, by the way, by the way, this is for tomorrow, but um, is I always or I sometimes use the printer at work for my personal work. And I was thinking, hmm, well, now that I'm home, I have to use my own printer. So um, I'm definitely not using the printer at work for personal things. Um, I'm using the printer, obviously, for work and sometimes for personal things. But sometimes with ethics, some things are really black and white and other things are gray. And we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk tomorrow about the ethical importance of wellness and why that's really um, an important piece. Uh, there'll be another piece tomorrow actually about technology and that'll probably be before wellness because there's a lot of things that go on with technology that um, are violations of ethics. I was thinking, I don't know if you heard this, um, this situation, I obviously I saw this on Facebook, but there was a teacher and she was in Alabama, which is a middle school teacher. And she wrote some really racist things on her Facebook account. And so of course, everybody was trying to share them. So I looked up the school that she taught at just to see what's going on and guess what, she was fired. So, so many things, by the way, that were put on social media even if you think it's your personal social media, people have access to, and I think that's really um, important to um, look at. We'll talk about that actually more tomorrow. Okay, um, this is the agenda. Actually, I just kind of went over part one and part two, and uh, so I don't know, need to repeat that one again. So I guess here's a question. Let me throw out a question uh, for the chat box. Let's see how this works is, Actually, when you hear the term ethics, and I know I've got a bunch of stuff up there or some different kinds of definitions, but when you hear or think about the term ethics, what comes to mind for you? It doesn't have to be a clinical answer or something from a dictionary. What comes to mind for you when you think about ethics? So if you would please write in um, into the um, chat box and hopefully I'll get it. So ethics. Hey, Clyde, I'm not seeing it again, but um, not sure what I'm doing wrong today. So um, as people, if you're writing, if you're not writing, oh, now I see it. 
So parameters, I used to make sure I'm providing the best and correct services for clients. Thank you for writing that in. A code of conduct for professional fields. Thank you very much, everybody. Doing things morally. What else? Because I know you are required to take ethics. So standards are right or good behavior. Thank you. Doing the right thing. All right, so let's see what we have up here. And these, by the way, are from the dictionary, one of the different dictionaries. But ethics really is a system of beliefs that affect behavior. So basically, um, you know that there's a lot of do's and don'ts in the work that you do. And some things help people, some things actually cause harm. So it's a system of beliefs and it affects what you do. Um, it's also another definition is standards of right or good action. And I'm going to jump to morals. So it's interesting too, because when you look at the term moral, it means conforming to generally accepted ideas of what is right and just in human contact. So one of the questions I often ask is, um, are all morals ethical? Are all ethics moral? Are they the same thing? Um, and you don't have to um, answer that, but it's something uh, to think about because morals change. And sometimes you may be working at a place where your morals, what you think is important, may be different than what the law says. Um, so I think it's something um, to keep in mind. Again, I, actually, I will say if you have questions, please write them in. Uh, because it kind of keeps things um, moving and um, I think it's uh, helpful. Uh, so, actually, what are your feelings about the difference between morals and ethics? Morals and ethics, what comes to mind for you? you know, these questions are tricky today. They're not simple yes, no questions. <laughs> Okay, so let me go on to the next one, next page. And really, you know, why are we going to have um, a code of ethics? So what do we want to do? We want to safeguard the welfare of patients and clients. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If there weren't codes of ethics, and actually confidentiality, by the way, which is a law, goes under the code of ethics. And if you knew that, or you were a client and you knew that your um, records, people, everybody in the world would have access to your records, you probably wouldn't go for treatment. So guard privacy, it looks at confidentiality. It helps you uh, to maintain quality service. Like what do you do that is good? And also, you know, it's interesting because some of the codes of ethics or some of uh, some of the professions have been around longer than substance to be substance use counselors. So this really, I think, gives people a good sense of really what's the quality and it also just helps in terms of reputation. Uh, it also, you re it helps you represent honestly your, your qualifications. So those are some things to um, keep in mind. Some of the traditions, and this, by the way, comes from uh, NADAC, and you probably have seen some of these before, um, and they are autonomy, beneficence, and justice. So let's look at autonomy. Autonomy is respect for people, and when I was studying, restudying for this, I took some information from um, a professor named Dr. Tarvidas. She used to teach at the University of Iowa, and she always was really helpful for doing trainings for the vocational rehabilitation counselors in New York. And what she looked at was in terms of autonomy, she said that we allow others the freedom to choose their destiny. And um, when you think about that, that's really about respect. Yeah, thanks for the person. Oh, now people are writing in. So morals is based on the person's beliefs 
and ethics are agreed standards for professional practices. And I think that's a good way of um, looking at it. So for example, depending on your, your religious background, you may believe as part of your religion that certain things you wouldn't do or are, can I use the word sins? But by law, some of those are different. So I think it's like something to look out for. I think one of the big things, um, kind of some of the hot buttons around ethics and what people have to kind of struggle with is a couple of things, um, depending on your views on uh, being pro-life um, or women's choice, uh, you may have views about abortion that it is a sin, and yet you, some of you live in states where it is okay by law. So the law, it's interesting. You have to figure out, I think for yourselves, where do you wanna work? and uh, what's the best place uh, for you. So something to keep in mind. Beneficence means do no harm. So that is something that we've heard, I think from Hippocrates many years ago. And it's also really about working within your limits. So sometimes I used to have a slide that says like stay in your lane. So sometimes what happens is we wanna help somebody and then they ask us to do things that we're not qualified to do, but it's kind of seductive because they asked us to do them and then we can actually do some harm. And then justice is fairness to all. And as Dr. Tarvita said, and she said this a long time ago and seems to be very relevant today, but know your biases. You know, Diana Padilla, my colleague has been doing a lot of courses on culture, but, and certainly we've been talking a lot in the world um, about racism. So know your biases. One of the things that happens is if you don't know what your biases are, then you could inflict them on other people, not not be not not being aware of them. Uh, you want to advocate against discrimination, and that fits under justice. I can't when I'm doing a webinar. I can't always see people's faces, obviously, but you can write in things if you'd like to as I'm going along. And I think just it's important to put out um, this, these are also some of the, they are the basic moral traditions of codes of ethics. All right, so here it is, I am gonna ask you to write this in. What do you think is the best way to teach ethics? What do you think, I know you're, some of you are mandated to take these courses. What is the best way to teach ethics? Anybody, so please write in, what do you think? Okay. Yeah, giving scenarios, I think that's really helpful. Tomorrow we'll do that in this course. I think it's important and then also um, in case conferences to bring up issues as they go along to teach in a class. Yes, by example, example is a really good teacher. Um, someone else wrote in scenarios and leading by example. Thank you, because I think these are important because, yeah, and to discuss them, as somebody said, is also helpful. So it gives you an idea of, you know, what to do, how to do it. It gives you an opportunity to really process your own stuff. Thanks for writing in, by the way, using examples or personal dilemmas. Yes, thank you. Supervision with the supervisor. And this is a really good case for those of you who are supervisors or those of you who are getting supervision, and I hope that's everybody, that I think it's really helpful um, to do that. So thanks for um, writing that in. There's a, again, there's a variety of ways um, sometimes it's taken a course like this. Some of you had to take courses when you were getting your degrees for a whole semester. Um, some of you are getting it through supervision. And modeling is another way, actually, for those of you to teach ethics. Yeah, training by a company or agency. Yes, yeah, so that's why actually we like to do ethic tra ethics trainings here. So many ways of doing it. This is one way that um, we can help. So we'll be reviewing the um, 
the uh, the Oasis canon of ethics, but just so you know, it was it was developed or used as a guide by uh, by NADAC. A couple of things, and I'm going to go to the next next page. Here's something. This is before we get to some of the Oasis uh, pieces. I'm going to look at. You could see, for example, um, this is what. NADAC said to consider. So there's like 17 different words and I'll, we'll look at them. Autonomy, we already went over. I'll tell you what they said they are and then you, I may ask you which one you like the best. So here goes. So autonomy, again, we just went over that. Obedience. Now, when I first saw that and I've worked on this with people in in-person trainings, everybody goes, the obedience, ugh. Uh, what they mean by the way is to observe and obey legal and ethical directives. So that's pretty clear. Conscientious refusal is an interesting one. So that you can refuse to carry out illegal or unethical directives. So I know having been in the field for a while, sometimes supervisors or agencies will tell counselors to do things that are against the law. And you always don't want to lose your job, but you do have the um, ability. In fact, these days it's better to refuse. Um, and that is one of the considerations from NADAC. Beneficence is to help others work hard within your limits, duty to protect. Another one they put is gratitude. So it, the way they describe it is passing along the good we receive to others. And I know in this field, uh, many of you are working with your own gratitude. And actually gratitude comes up a lot in self-care with uh, especially during the pande pandemic. Yes, yeah, somebody just wrote in. Yes, um, you can get the credits. Uh, we don't have social work credits, but these will be OASIS credits. Uh, so going back to gratitude. Um, and competence. And again, it's really what are the skills and techniques that you have? So I will ask you out of those six, which one do you like the best or which one speaks to you the most and why? Which So autonomy, obedience, conscientious refusal, beneficence, gratitude, or competence, which do you like the best? Please write in. Gratitude. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. So gratitude seems to be getting a lot of the votes. Up oh, more votes for gratitude. Oh, cool. That's actually my favorite of those three. Um, and as some of you have heard me in other courses, I've been keeping a gratitude journal for many, many, many years. And I have this theory that the more grateful you are, the better your life becomes. And it's funny how you can be grateful for simple things uh, and not necessarily always like gigantic things. So um, gratitude. Thanks everybody for uh, writing that in. Let's go to the second slide. Going right along. Um, I will read what they said about it and then you can oh and actually somebody put confidence yes it's important to, to know what you're doing so thank you uh for writing uh, that in so on this from 7 to 12 we've got justice stewardship honesty and candor fidelity loyal diligence so let me read what they said and then you can tell me which speaks to you the most so justice, fair and equal treatment, again, advocating for, or I mean, against discrimination. Stewardship is giving back. And it's interesting because many people will actually um, get into the field. For those of you in recovery, sometimes people will say that somebody helped you and you wanna give back. So stewardship means giving back. Honesty and candor, to tell the truth. Fidelity is being true to your word. So you tell a client, yes, I'll meet you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Or these days it's like, no, I'll call you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And you do that. And that's actually how you develop uh, good relationships with people, but really being true to your word. Um, loyalty, not to abandon people. And diligence, working hard. So 
which of those do speaks to you? Anybody? So please, using the chat. Okay, we got a lot actually. Justice, honesty, and candor and diligence. So it's hard sometimes to pick. Oh, fidelity. Yes, thank you. We have votes for other ones. Difficult to choose between justice and fidelity. Yeah, I'm I'm just giving you it, it is hard actually to figure out which is important, but honesty and candor and stewardship. So um just something to think about. Um there's not right or wrong answers. Um it's just that it gives the, you the opportunity to kind of look at, yeah, ethics, this is what um it's involved. Honesty and loyalty. Thanks everybody for writing in. And then this last page. At least the last page of these considerations is uh, discretion, using good judgment, self-improvement, working on yourself actually professionally and personally, restitution, making amends. So for people in 12-step programs, that I think resonates, but it's about making amends. And self-interest is also protecting yourself. So um, those are some things to think about. Um, I'm not going to ask you because of time. I want to make sure I get through the OASIS uh, codes today. So let me go on. This, I think, is important by the way is, and this is part of ethics, is mandated reporters. My guess is that most of you are mandated reporters. And here I think it's important to be clear. Um, you are legally required to report suspicion of child abuse or neglect. You're legally required to report suspicion. Do you have to know what was really happening? Not necessarily, but if you suspect, it's important to do that. And actually, I called that hotline the last time I did the course just to see who answered. And actually, they were very, they answered the phone really quickly. And I told them what I was doing, and they gave me some. Uh, information, I think that was helpful, but when should you report as soon as possible? You know, it depends too, by the way, is at your jobs. Some of you may be going through supervisors, but it's important to know what is the, uh, what you need to do at your place. Uh, another thing that's important is you are immune from civil liability. What does that mean? That means if you report somebody, they cannot sue you in a civil suit. Um, to get back at you. And I think that's important to know because I think people are afraid sometimes to report and uh, they're afraid that they're going to get sued or they're afraid that somebody's going to come and beat them up. Uh, but here's what is also important to know. If you don't report, you could be charged with a misdemeanor. So it is important to report. I have found, and some of you have who worked for child services know that uh, you don't have to have proof, but if you have this suspicion, it's important to look at. Um, one of the things I was thinking about this is that sometimes uh, people have told me stories about that they really like a client and they don't want to get them in trouble um, or they think it will impact on their recovery. But this one is, by the way, very black and white. So you really are legally required. Um, that hotline, at least in New York, it works. New Jersey, LA, I don't know, by the way, but chances are you um, have that as well. Yeah, as other agencies, by the way, um, it's important to actually uh, for the some for the person who wrote in OPWDD. Can you oh, actually? I have a. Can you actually tell us what that stands for? Because I don't want to make a mistake on that one. So the person who just wrote in about OPWDD, I'm going to guess DD is for developmental disabilities. But you are mandated reporters. One thing they added around mandated reporters, by the way, is for people who are older. So that also gets uh, reported. So um, just to know, you can't like play with that one. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Office of People with Deve Developmental Disability. Thank you for writing that in. Um, so with people with developmental disabilities, it goes as well. And actually, it's interesting because often people with developmental disabilities often become often are abused and nobody gets to um, find out or nobody believes the person. So I think that's important as well. All right. So let's go to the 
20 principles of the canon of ethical principles from OASIS. Everybody ready? So, you know, I'm going to ask you a question about this. A um, couple of things. I'll read it and then uh, I'll read the first two and then we can, you can ask me questions, by the way. So, one is, must, pre must practice objectivity and integrity. Maintain the highest standards in the services offered. Respect the values, attitude, and opinions of others and provide services only in an appropriate professional relationship. It really covers a lot of things, by the way. And number two is, must not discriminate in work-related activities based on race, religion, age, gender, disabilities, ethnicity, national origins, sexual orientation, economic condition, or any other basis prescribed by law. So that too um, says a lot. So on the next slide, I'll ask you to think about, and I know if everybody answered all these questions, it would take a really long time, but it, it's interesting as, as I was reading those and I'll go back to them, uh, I'll ask, is how does how do you adhere to those principles? How do you adhere? So we'll take one of the questions. How do you personally adhere to those principles? So let me go back. To the first two, how do you adhere or how does your agency adhere to these? How do you or how does your agency adhere? So please write in. It can be a simple response. And I think again, if you're not taking courses in cultural competence or you never have, chances are you have, I think it's important to really um, look at that um, as, as well. Anybody, any responses? Let's practice objectivity and integrity. Thanks, thanks for writing, by practicing them in with interactions with others and self. Uh, we have, somebody wrote in, mandated ethics training at work and cultural training, which is a really, you know, a good thing to have, and it gives you the opportunity to, I think, to continually assess where you are on that. Two, use non-gender bias pronouns. And actually, that kind of goes to the piece on language. And um, you know, it's interesting, I'm giving a presentation at a conference in, um, in September, and they gave us all these guidelines and what they said was, and, I, and luckily I knew this, but uh, they said, don't start your presentation saying, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because you don't want to, again, you want non-gender bias pronouns. And so they tell us to say, good afternoon, everyone. So um, just if you look at kind of the language that you use or the language that's on your assessment forms, that will help you. Um, somebody wrote in, again, it's really continuous reflections on one's own bias. And I know many people are doing that um, these days. And again, really important um, to look at. All right, let me go to three and four. Uh, must respect the integrity and protect the welfare of the person or the group with whom the counselor is working, must embrace as a primary obligation the duty to protect the privacy and must not disclose confidential information. A couple of things about this, by the way, is that usually the law will supersede ethics. The law will supersede ethics. So sometimes you may see something as ethical, but if it's breaking the law, you really have to go with the law. So it's why it's important to know about confidentiality laws about being a mandated reporter. Um, those are really important. Oh yeah, and somebody said, uh, will we be emailed a copy of today's slideshow? Yes, in fact, I'm sorry I didn't say this, but uh, at, at the end of tomorrow, um, you will get a copy of the slides. Um, 
and I'll tell you tomorrow exactly how long that'll take. So you will get that. Uh, one thing I didn't also uh, say at the beginning is if some of you are at, you're welcome. If some of you are at um, computers with a number of people, make sure, please actually type in your name. Now, if you're by yourself, your computer and you're registered, because actually you wouldn't be on if you weren't registered, you don't have to write your name. But I know at least prior to COVID is often people would be in a room together or sharing a phone. Uh, hopefully you're all social distancing, uh, but it's helpful for us actually for Tree Chapel, our admin person to make sure that your name is there. Cause we wanna make sure that you get the certificates. So going back to the ethical ones is, um, the thing I take out from three and four, as I wrote in my notes, do the right thing. All right, let's talk about, hopefully this will be interesting uh, as well, but this, by the way, is not, this is not a gray area. This is black and white. And actually this, um, actually people having sexual relationships with their patients um, is still one of the most common, uh, breaks in um, the, the laws. And actually, by the way, in some of your states, it is a uh, felony. So here's what we got. And what we'll do is we'll look at what they are. Um, I've got some slides on why it might, why it's harmful to have a sexual relationship with somebody, why they may come on to you, what you can do about it. All right. So as I said, um, this one is black and white. I, I will say also with, o, with Oasis, is see where it says number six must not engage in any sexual activity with current or former patients or their significant others. There's not a date there, by the way, and that means never. Some of you who are social workers, your uh, codes of ethics will say never. In uh, the codes of ethics that I've followed, the CRC, the Certified Rehabilitation Counselors, they say that you can after five years. However, you have to look at would you having a sexual relationship with a former client do them harm? Um, so sometimes they'll give very specifics, like if the person has had a psychotic illness or uh, very serious mental health issues, the answer is no. So you can read that there, uh, must not engage, I already read that. And again, it also includes significant others of the client. And you think like you make up stories, but when I've trained, by the way, is that sometimes people tell me stories that um, a counselor or social worker starts a relationship with the partner of one of their clients. So think about that. Uh, think about the ramifications of that and then going back to doing no harm to everybody. Um, you could also take courses, and this is actually another number seven really has to do with sexual harassment. And um, that is also, uh, an area actually to have trainings. So thanks, as people are writing in, I appreciate that um, because that'll be the next uh, piece. So this is a big no, by the way. So no sexual activities with clients, families, or clients. Uh, that includes e-relationships. So it's interesting. So if you are having a an online relationship with somebody, that counts um, as well. That counts as well, and that's why I was, as I was thinking yesterday about how how people are getting involved inappropriately with people during COVID. You know what are people doing? But so it includes e relationships. Um, on the next slide, we'll look at why is it harmful to the client if you have a sexual relationship. So actually, what do you think? Why do you think it's harmful to the client if you have a sexual relationship with them? Um, somebody just wrote, had just written in taking advantage of the individual in a sexual relationship uses control. Thank you. I think that's um, important as well. Can you think of other, other reasons why it might be? Oh, somebody said, you, yeah. If you're having Wi-Fi problems, if it's only one person, usually sometimes it's the broadband and Clyde will take a look at that. He's watching this. I can't really help with that um, as I'm presenting. Anybody else? Why is it harmful? I 
like me to show you? Okay, here's some reasons. This is stuff you're pretty uh, familiar with, but it really breaks down the therapeutic relationship. Uh, yeah, somebody wrote in, it's unhealthy. You bet, thank you. Um, our population is very vulnerable. And I mean, think about it. Uh, it creates role reversal, creates confusion for the client. Um, sometimes somebody was telling me a story, actually a client was telling me a story that they were having sex with their counselor or they were a former client who is now a counselor. And they said that it turned out to be such a dangerous thing and it took away from any kind of treatment, obviously. And as somebody wrote in too, clients, they're already vulnerable and you make them dependent on you. And one of the things too is, you know, you might be the first person who listened to them, the first person who paid attention to them. And so in a sense, it's taking advantage of their vulnerability. Um, this last bullet, by the way, um, and Oasis has an hour, I think one of their hour, remember they used to have those Thursday uh, sessions. Um, what they said is that it increases suicidal risk and depression for clients. So think about it. Your job is to help people get better. And then this increases suicidal risk and depression for the clients. And you, it's really uh, impossible to have a good therapeutic relationship. Um, somebody just wrote in, thank you. Yeah, it breaks the do no harm rule, you bet violates trust in treatment and therapeutic progress. It also, by the way, gives all everybody a bad name. Um, so that, and you know, some of the, you hear about people's reputations or agency's reputations. Uh, I think it's something to keep in mind. Um, on the next thing, what, what a lot of times people used to say to me, especially people who are new in the field and or maybe in early recovery is, um, you know, they were coming on to me. I didn't know what to do. Um, we'll look at that actually about what you're supposed to do. Um, but one of the reasons they might come on to you is they might feel love. And I was just saying, you know, you're listening to somebody, you're paying attention. Somebody had just written in that they may feel dependent. They may feel dependent on you. They might look at you as a savior. And yes, thank you for the person who wrote it. It goes against the ethics you signed up for. And they might look at you as a parent. But as I say that, I'm thinking if they look at you as a parent and you're having sex with them, that is another kind of creepy thing to be doing. So um, it really does go on to, but here's the key is they can do whatever they want, by the way. I mean, sometimes they will come on to you, but who's, whose job is it to say no? It's yours. It's kind of when I hear of stories of, a teacher who has sex with a uh, somebody who's 14 and they always blame the 14 year old. It's like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. It's the person, you know, she was flirting with me. He was flirting with me. Um, it's your job as the, as the professional to set boundaries. And actually you teach people about boundaries anyway by setting good boundaries. So they can come on to you, but your job is to uh, really work with that. Um, some of sometimes people work in residential treatment centers, and you always have to be careful about. For example, when you go into a room, if some if you're going into somebody's bedroom to do counseling, you got to look at that. You can't close the door. So sometimes people say, "Well, I had to close the door because it was about um, confidentiality," and it's like, no, people get into a lot of trouble because of that. And some of you have heard stories like that. Um, very much so your job is to set the boundaries. I think it's important though to know when you might be most vulnerable to getting involved with the client. Uh, if you're going through a tough time, whatever that is, you know, I always used to use examples of you, um, maybe you lost a parent or a partner or a child. Um, these days, the tough time might be you're going through COVID or you've had COVID or you've lost family members from COVID, but if you're going through a tough time, it's important for you to realize that you could be vulnerable. Uh, I just gave probably the example about dealing with loss. And that's why it's important for us to really take care of ourselves. So when we are dealing with a loss, to look at that and it's, it's really important. Uh, when they look at the, um, at impairment, by the way, you know, a lot of times I think, oh, impairment, somebody's drinking or drugging again. But sometimes people can be impaired because they're dealing with things that are really overwhelming. And now it's like a really 
tough time for many people. Um, if you have low self-esteem um, and then somebody kind of comes on to you, it, you may feel vulnerable. And if you're not working your own recovery program. So for those of you who are in recovery, um, and actually I think people are in recovery from every, from a variety of things, not just alcohol and other drugs, but if you're not working on your own health, um, you can be vulnerable. So I hope that makes sense. Cause I think it's, it's important to kind of um, look at it. Also, it doesn't happen right away. You know, sometimes you find, for example, you're being really nice to one client, nicer to one client and not another, that it's almost like grooming them. Uh, the example I used to use was, let's say you had candy on your desk at a time when you were at your desk and you offered candy to one client, but not to everybody else, or you kind of kind of went the extra mile, but it wasn't about being sticking to um, the boundary. So just be aware of that, um, but because the onus is on us. Any questions on that? I think that's pretty um, clear, but it still always surprises me that it's still one of the biggest things that people um, do. All right, moving on, moving along. So we're at eight through 10, and actually some of this, I know all of you can read, but must not exploit patients or others over whom they have a position of authority, of authority. in a sense, by the way, you do have, uh, or are perceived as having authority, but you don't want to exploit people because of that. You also, it's interesting because it says that you have to treat your colleagues and other professions or professionals with respect, courtesy, and fairness. You're not supposed to, by the way, gossip about other people. Um, and I know that's a tricky one. Um, this is one I think is, this kind of goes to the and stuff I'll cover next week on ethics and impairment uh, or self-care. But if, I'll, let me read it word for word, must notify appropriate authorities, including employers and OASIS, when they have direct knowledge of a colleague's impairment or misconduct, which interferes with treatment effectiveness and potentially places patients at risk. So this is a tricky one because sometimes as people, let's say a counselor relapses um, or is doing, is, is impaired in other ways, um, your ethics, by the way, and I know people don't like to snitch on other people, but it's really important that you don't hide those kind of things. I don't know how people feel about that, but in an ideal world, by the way, uh, people would, and probably the, on the next, the next one on 11, is people would recognize their own impairment and get help. And let me say, from, the, from, the, from your employee assistance programs, if you are impaired, it's better that you go to the employee assistance program because then you will also safeguard your job, but you can't keep that stuff can't keep that stuff secret. I think sometimes it gets tricky when people are, you know, dealing with their friends and colleagues that they like. So just be aware of, again, your, the possibility that you are doing harm or others are. So uh, like I said, 11 really is expected to recognize your own impairment. And that's better than actually having somebody else recognize your own impairment and not provide services that create conflict of interest or impair work performance and clinical judgment. I think what comes to mind too, though, is that some of your centers it, um, have cars and uh, New York City, we don't have this so much, but in other places, if a counselor is driving clients in a car and that's their job, you know, they're allowed to do that. Um, and you know that they've been drinking or drugging. I think that's something to really um, keep in mind. All right, moving right along, must cooperate with investigations. Yes, you have to do that. Um, another thing you can do or not do is you must not participate in the filing of ethics complaints that are frivolous. Sometimes people, not like revenge sex, but, uh, or revenge, people getting back at other people for a variety of reasons, but sometimes people will, will file an ethics complaint against somebody because they're angry at them for whatever reason that is, but you can't do that. All right, moving right along. 
must assure the, that financial pr practices are in accord with professional standards that safeguard the client. You may or may not have control over this, but I think sometimes some of the stories I've heard is sometimes I, I, I won't, I won't, rep I obviously aren't, I, I'm not going to repeat uh, specifics, but sometimes people are doing a group and there's three people in the group, but they tell the insurance company there's five people in the group. Sometimes people are ready for termination, but the supervisors or the agencies want to keep people in their practice. So you really have to be um, cool with that. Another thing is another like horror story is sometimes many years ago, I think an athlete gave money to an agency so they could go buy televisions. And guess what? The counselors took the televisions home. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about that, but you wanna think about, that's also a felony if you're stealing televisions from patients. So you just wanna be really um, careful about that. I also think when I've heard stories is you always have to ask yourself about your site and your agency. If they're really breaking the law or not following ethics, you might wanna look at maybe another job. And I know that's easier said than done. Uh, you do have to, again, 15 must take reasonable steps to ensure the documentation and records is accurate, sufficient and timely. Um, I think that is pretty specific, although I've heard, you know, again, horror stories about what people put in, that is not true. But again, you, you don't wanna be liable for that. All right, moving right along. You must uphold the legal and accepted moral codes, which per pertain to professional conduct. Um, and probably here's a good thing. You do, the, the advantage about, I think most of us have to take courses to keep, to recredential. And I think that's really good. Think about all the things that we've learned, even in the past, I don't know, five years about medication assisted treatment, about telehealth. Nobody used to know about telehealth. Um, and so now, it's really helpful to look at and keep learning, learning, learning so that you can improve your um, skills, your expertise, uh, just, you know, makes you a better person, a better counselor. Another thing too for 18 is you need to acknowledge the limits of your present knowledge and you really have to be, let's say, as it says there, the case act must report fairly and accurately the appropriate information and must acknowledge and document materials um, and techniques used. So for example, it's, it's like when you're in school, if you're writing a paper, you have to source everything. And um, remember somebody wrote a book and they, it was about, it was actually a textbook, but they wrote in the 12 steps, but they didn't source it. They didn't source anything. And it lo looks like they made up every, all the 12 steps. Um, which they didn't. So you really need to be um, clear about that as well. And there's two more. You have to give credit to all who have contributed to the published material and for the work upon which the publication is based. So that was kind of what I was just saying. And also, um, I think it's important to kind of look at um, how you, uh, what you do publicly. So you may be, for example, speaking publicly about your job or actually now being on a podcast or being on any kind of, of social media, but to kind of know what you can do and what you can't do. So the case act must adopt a personal and professional stance, which promotes the well-being of the recovery community. So that's the 20 things. Let's see. What we have on the next slide, by the way, is what are some of the big problems? Um, so you can add to this if you'd like to, by the way, but the big one again continues to be inappropriate sexual relationships. Another one is dual relationships. And that means that sometimes you fulfill, or you have to be careful is if you have a second job, let's say you're a counselor and a hairdresser or a counselor and a bartender, a counselor and, um, you have to be really careful about what your second job is because you can't really have dual relationships with people. Now, they might have dual relationships, like they, you might know them, like for example, in some of the rural sites, 
Um, I know that sometimes like there might be one auto mechanic and that person is on your on your um, your uh, list or on your on your it's somebody that you counsel and you have to kind of look at that and figure out what to do. Um, if it is, if it does happen that they're the only auto mechanic within like two hours, then you just get clear about setting um, a boundary about what is work and what's getting my car fixed. And you don't want to, by the way, actually bartering is not up here, but in some places they'll do bartering. I think Oasis is not keen on bartering, but what it means is that sometimes somebody doesn't have the money for something and then you exchange services. So you could do that, but you have to be really clear um, and uh, not get into trouble with that. You know, somebody wrote in, it's like having a client by day and serving him drinks by night because you were a bartender. Yeah, so look at what your second job is. I always tell people, if you have to follow the ethics during the day and then you're a bartender, you know, and everybody looks at bartenders, by the way, as counselors. And sometimes people tell people lots of things you have to be aware of what your day job um, is. Or like, for example, a lot of times people do hairdressing on the side and what do people do when they're getting their hair done or going to the barber is talk. Um, so just know that for yourselves. Where I've seen it get people get into trouble is when somebody's a counselor and a minister. And the reason I say that, by the way, is because the counselor has to follow the code of ethics and confidentiality. As a minister, they don't have to follow the, the law and confidentiality. So, um, as we say, sometimes they have to answer to a higher power, but I've seen people get kind of confused about that. So, you want to think that out about what you do during the day and what your job might be at night. Um, other ethical problems, competence and conduct with clients. Confidentiality, again, a big one. So confidentiality around substance use. Um, there's confidentiality laws around mental health, confidentiality laws around HIV. That one is the law, so you don't want to break that. Remuneration really has to do with, uh, with money and publication credit. I mean, another big one is sometimes people will put initials after their name that they don't have, and that gets people into trouble a lot. Um, I know as a voc rehab counselor, if you lie when you are filling out an application, like you tell somebody you had a bachelor's degree, but you never finished it, um, and the place finds out later on, you can, you'll be fired. So you just want to be really kind of clear on that. Um, you don't want to get into trouble for um, that. All right, I think I have one more slide for today. And for those of you in recovery, by the way, and actually I may do a course next month on relapse issues for uh, counselors in recovery and actually peer advocates, is that, and I know that term relapse prevention is not used so much anymore. I heard that the term is return to use, but the course has been approved by Oasis for that title. But anyway, here's the, here's the thing to keep in mind is recovering counselors, for those of you in recovery, you know that you really are in a position to be role models and that it's interesting because sometimes we always used to discuss in supervision, do you have to be in recovery? Do you not have to be in recovery? Basically, when people are asking you if you're in recovery, often what they're also asking you is, can I trust you? And then for some of you, by the way, people kind of figure out or they guess early on that they think you are in recovery. But to kind of go back to this is that actually it shows people, it shows clients that there's hope that they can. So we also know that learning occurs from modeling. So what they see you do, and that's why also you have to follow ethics because your clients will do what you do, not what you tell them to do. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though, is that just because somebody's in recovery doesn't mean you're gonna be a good counselor, but I'm gonna say that the combination of studying counseling, however you do that, and then also um, one's recovery um, is, 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 is strong, uh, but you have to watch out, by the way, is one of the reasons you have to, and this to me this is like an ethical piece, is you really have to take care of yourself because if you relapse, now I know that we talk about relapse being part of the, the, the process for some people, not for everybody, but you are constantly kind of hit with other people's triggers, with other people's stories, and so I think it's important to really look at 
how you take care of yourself because you don't want to relapse. Um, it's interesting because I think in other fields, sometimes when people relapse, it's it's kept quiet. Um, in our field, it tends to people, everybody tends to know. So um, these are the slides for um, today. So let me throw out, what questions do you have? Because tomorrow we'll come back and we'll continue um, and we'll look at some of those ethical questions. So it would be helpful is, what questions do you have? So let me just repeat, you will get copies of the slides after tomorrow, we'll tell you when you're gonna get them. Um, some of you have written your names in if you are sharing a computer. Uh, we need you to be here tomorrow and we'll be here tomorrow from noon to 1.30. So um, we still have a fair amount of time to, what are some of the questions? I went over this kind of fast. Uh, what are some of the questions that you have about ethics that we've talked about so far? So please think of any questions. I think I like it better when I tell people to just keep writing questions in the whole time and not waiting till the end, but now's your opportunity is, what are some of the questions you have about something that um, I, I discussed today? What questions can I answer today? I think as people are writing or maybe not writing, um, I'll tell you some of the things you can think about for tomorrow because we'll look at ethics and technology and you can start to think about what are some of the challenges you've had with ethics and technology and what are some of the, I think, ethical pieces, especially since many people are working at home and not seeing clients in person uh, what are some things that have come up for you um, on that that may uh, be affected by ethics? Oh yeah, coworkers in recovery. I guess, and the question is about coworkers in recovery. For the person who wrote that in. <clears throat> All right, other questions? Another thing you can think about for tomorrow is, also you can tell me what courses you're gonna to wanna to say. Yeah, so people are writing no questions at the moment and that's okay. One of the things I'll also ask you to think about is what courses would you like to see Let me see if I'm missing things. Okay, sorry, I am. my things are not popping up today. Okay, can you go over conscientious refusal? Yes, what conscientious refusal means is that sometimes there's something that ethically you can't do or illegal and it's okay for you to say no. Another question, how to approach a coworker in recovery who may have had a relapse? I would say, depending on the relationship, first of all, I know people like to do it themselves first um, and see how that works and encourage the person to get help. Uh, but if they don't, you're gonna have to report it to your supervisor. Ah, good questions. Now that we're working virtually, how have the confidentiality laws changed or become more flexible? You know what, they haven't changed. Um, I think, what they're looking at or what you have to look at is when you are working virtually, what are some of the, um, what is your job set up so that it goes with confidentiality? So um, for example, like if you're doing a Zoom session with somebody and somebody in your house or your apartment is walking by or listening to what you're doing, um, another thing, you're doing a Zoom session with somebody and then somebody, again, a friend or your family member walks in, they could see all the pictures of who's there. So it's easy to break people's confidentiality. 
and um, it's important to think about. So thank you. Oh, somebody said, will this be saved for reference at a later date? At some point later on, it will be recorded. Yeah, and somebody wrote, um, I don't think there are many questions because the ethics are written in black and white. However, I think that people sometimes try to validate the reasons why they break them, yes, as well as may start off doing unconsciously and then not wanting to take responsibility. Yeah, and I think, you know, people have to be careful about things because, I'll give an example. I worked at a place once where you were told you couldn't take any money from, like if you gave a presentation, you could not take money. It was against the, the the rules at this place. And I went someplace and somebody offered me $25, which maybe a long time ago was a decent amount of money, but I didn't take it because and somebody said, why'd you give back the $25? I said, I'm not gonna lose my job over $25. And then sometimes the other things, I remember o Oasis, by the way, sent me a check once. That was a mistake and I had to send it back. Um, so. I think people start off getting away with things and then it gets out of hand. All right, thank you. I guess now I see what everybody's writing in. People in recovery have to be careful not to impose their experience on their clients. Absolutely. So one of the things that happens, and this is a counselor thing is, your job is to help people into recovery. And it's sometimes helpful to know what worked for you, but sometimes people impose what worked for them on somebody else. So sometimes, by the way, also for those of you who are in abstinence-based recovery, it's a little tricky when you're working with somebody who is a harm reduction client and they're talking about their use and you're thinking, what's up with that? So just be aware that I think know yourself, that's another thing. Um, and for everybody to not impose your yourself. And that's why I think it's important to go to therapy if you're a counselor to get supervision and to keep on working it. Um, somebody just wrote into working from home and not helping clients right now is hard for me, but I think you're, oh, yeah, I like for people to take a part in a presentation. I know that, for example, if I'm on a webinar and they don't ask me to write in, I start to think of other things I can do or start like nodding a little. Um, accepting personal gifts too is a problem. You know, it's interesting too, because they used to, and I think maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow, but they used to be very specific about you couldn't take a personal gift that was more than $20. I think that's a challenge because this whole thing about accepting personal gifts, these days, if people don't have money and they're giving you presents, um, you want to look at that. And sometimes what happens at a site is say somebody says, oh, so-and-so gave the counselor or like for those who are teachers, um, it also becomes a problem because word on the street is, oh, I better give this counselor the $20 gift card to Starbucks because everybody else is. And so you don't want to do that. Um, also, sometimes too, is sometimes people give you gifts that are very inappropriate. Um, so if they're sexual, if they're whatever, you, you really need to actually put a uh, stop on that. But I would also let people know, actually with a lot of things, let your supervisors know. Even going back to, for example, if somebody's coming on to you a lot and you're setting a boundary and it's not working, make sure it's on paper or make sure it's documented in their uh, on the computer, uh, but also let people know you don't want to keep that quiet because it'll be your word versus their word. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, somebody wrote in about home-based services, the boundaries are blurred. Yeah, they do. Sometimes, you know, we'll do some examples tomorrow of I think that might be helpful about when you take food from people, when you don't take food from people. All right, another person wrote, and thanks for writing this in, and I apologize if I wasn't seeing a lot of these things. I used to work at an addiction treatment center and our clients were often referred to treatment by probation, parole. Clients would refuse to sign for their referral. Are we ethically bound to not disclose treatment information? Can't confirm or deny person. Um, gosh, that's a good question. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that people in probation and parole are supposed to follow the same laws that we do. So I think it's important. Uh, I'll get a, a better answer for tomorrow if somebody knows that, because the question is, are we ethically bound to not disclosing treatment information? 
can't confirm or deny I've had contact with this person when the probation parole court reach out for information. If people want to think about that and write that in, that would be helpful. Uh, yes, going back to the gifts, pens or small items as gifts. The idea of the gifts creates issues. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Somebody also wrote practicing self-wellness and reviewing education is a big key because they remind you of what things you should, like the, like it keeps you on your toes. I think things creep up by the way and actually it keeps you on your toes. Uh, somebody wrote, what do you think about peer support specialist attending support meetings with the clients she works with at a treatment facility? Let me say that peer, peers have separate uh, codes of ethics, and I will do that course next month. Uh, peers are allowed to um, go to a support group meeting with the client. Now, it's tricky because they also need to have boundaries with that, but they are allowed to do that. If you're in, if you're in recovery and you're a counselor and you see somebody at a meeting, you have to figure out what you're going to share, what you're not going to share, um, and not become their sponsor right away. Oh yeah, somebody wrote in, this is another thing, I, I, another thought, I have often large caseloads, did not feel I could get good service or safely manage. I met with my supervisor and put a letter in my file in case a patient did not do well, for example, suicide. You know, it's interesting too, because everybody's got large caseloads and that, that helps with uh, create burnout. Uh, but I think again, you covered yourself and I think that's a good thing. Um, somebody wrote in, yes, you can only disclose with a specific court order and a consent for all other requests. So it's got to be a specific court court orders, by the way, which come from judges, you can disclose. Uh, if it's a subpoena by a lawyer, you do not have to disclose anything. So thank you for writing that in as well. Oh, this is another one. Thank you again. If in addition, if you do not provide client progress, the agency will stop referring clients to your program. And we, as we know, if people are not referring clients to your program, that is um, problematic. So it's some of the challenges I think you have to, that many of you deal with. It's probably good to talk to your supervisors. It's good to um, talk to each other and then also figure for yourselves, what do you do to um, take good care of yourself? And one of the reasons I was doing the course for next week, because a lot of the things we used to be able to do, like go to the gym or go to the movies or whatever, we can't do anymore. Now, some of you in other states, by the way, can do that. Um, so that's a New York example and maybe a New Jersey example. Uh, so for those of you in LA, I'm not sure what you can do, although I think you also are dealing with high numbers of COVID too. So. Yeah, so there's lots of good things. And again, I appreciate all of the, um, the comments. So any last minute questions as we go as we go along. Let me say it'll be on me if, if, if I end in two minutes, which I probably will is that you're still gonna get your hours. Um, I believe ethically that I need to give you your money's worth, even though you didn't have to pay. Um, but I wanna make sure that when you get your certificates for the three hours that you got and you learned what you had to do. So other questions other than that, if not, I will see you tomorrow um, at noon. And again, think about, for example, ethics and technology, some of the challenges, maybe ethics and wellness. And also, if you think of courses that you want me to teach in the future, um, that would be really um, helpful. Uh, Diana Padilla, who's my colleague, does a lot of work, as you know, on culture, and she does. she's like the expert person. Paul Warren, who is my colleague, also is like the master of uh, motivational interviewing. I tend to do a lot of things like on trauma-informed care and ethics and also um, on substance use. I do know that in October, we just finished actually a, a program that was done nationwide by people from all over the country, and it is going to be on stimulants. So there's gonna be lots of information actually about methamphetamines and also cocaine. So um, that will be something that we'll see. 
Yeah, some, and thanks for the person who wrote this in. If, if mandated clients refuse to sign consents, they can be remanded. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's another challenge. So thank you for writing that in. I think that's really helpful. All right, other comments, questions, loose ends? If not, then um, I thank you very much, by the way, and uh, thanks for the thanks, and I will hopefully see you tomorrow at noon. So have a good rest of the day, stay safe, and uh, see you tomorrow.